Thinking in Dark Times is a podcast series by Ukraine World. In this episode, I speak to Philippe Sands, a famous British and French writer and lawyer, about the concepts of genocide and crimes against humanity and about the future of international law. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko, I'm a Ukrainian philosopher and journalist and chief editor of ukraineworld.org, one of the most popular websites in English about Ukraine. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest Ukrainian media NGOs. Philip Sands is a professor of law and director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London and the author of the best-selling books. We spoke in Lviv, a city in western Ukraine, at the Lviv Book Forum two days before Russia's massive round of missile strikes on Ukrainian cities, including Lviv, in October. The series Thinking in Dark Times aims to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You can support us at patreon.com slash Ukraine world. So let's start. Philippe Sands, thanks so much for joining this podcast. Vladimir, it's incredibly nice to be with you. We are in Lviv and Lviv is a very important city for you. Uh, you wrote East-West Street, which is a fantastic account how the major concepts of international law, like crimes against humanity and genocide, connected are connected with the city. Why? Lviv, for me, is one of my homes. I came here for the first time in 2010. I had received an invitation to give a lecture at the university, at the law school, on the cases I do on crimes against humanity and genocide. I didn't know where Lviv was. I looked it up on Google. It was Lvov. It was Lemberg. And I remembered that my grandfather, who I knew very well, he lived until 1998, was born in Lemberg. And I got excited. I thought, wonderful. My grandfather never talked about anything that happened before 1945, I'll come to Lviv and I'll find the house where my grandfather was born. And it was about a question of identity. I wanted to know who my grandfather was. I wanted more information about him. And by knowing more about my grandfather, I'd know more about myself. And ever since that first day I arrived in the city, I liked it the moment I was here. I felt very at home here. And I've been back maybe 20 times in the intervening period. And it's a very special place for me. But these people whom I, you are discussing, uh, uh, Lauterpacht, who is a author of the concept of crimes against humanity, and Raphael Lemkin, the author of the concept of genocide, you link them to the experience of Lemberg, of Lviv. They were both studying at uh, Lviv University. And somehow their personal experience produced these concepts. Can you tell the story? Sure. I mean, I, I spent a long time working on this. It was very difficult to find the materials. I worked with a couple of wonderful PhD students, Ukrainian PhD students at the Ivan Franco Law School, Ivan and Igor. And eventually, it was very exciting. We found all the student documents from Lauterpacht and Lemkin, which should be, frankly, in a museum. Uh, they're still down in the bottom of a city, and someone should really save that material. We know exactly where it is. And astonishingly, having been invited to give a lecture on my work on crimes against humanity and genocide, and I knew the names Lauterpacht and Lemkin. My first teacher was the son of Hirsch Lauterpacht, Elie Lauterpacht. I discovered that Lviv was, in effect, the source of the ideas that caused these two men to go in their different directions. Lauterpacht believed passionately that the law should protect every individual human being, that they should have rights. It's called modern human rights law today. Lemkin said, well, this is a good idea, but people get killed or targeted, not because they're individuals who've done something, but because they're a member of a group. So if you want to protect the individual, focus on the group. And I understand both um, uh, theories. And I got deeper and deeper into the story. And I came to understand 
that the Lviv of the times that they lived here, Lauter Pact lived here from 1915 to 1919, Lemkin from 1921 to 1926. It was a remarkably multicultural city. There were basically three groups. There were the Poles, who were on the top of the pile. There were the Jews, who were sort of in the middle. And then they were, they were then called Ruthenians, Ukrainians, who were at the bottom. And you saw this in the student records. It was fascinating when we went through the volumes of student materials. There were um, hundreds of Polish students and then a few Jewish students, but almost no Ukrainian students. And you could understand how power worked in Lemberg, Lvov, before it became Lviv. And I became fascinated by what the city life was like over here. And I understood that these two men, Lauterpacht and Lemkin, lived in a city in which three communities were engaged in a struggle. And their idea was, how can the law help to avoid those struggles turning into bloodshed? And that's why I think Lviv is the heart of the story of the origins of these two crimes. That's fascinating. And... Um this is also the experience was a, an experience of pogroms against the Jewish population here. And do you think this suffering, this trauma, and the, the very fact that they were affected as people with Jewish origins, do, do you think that here we see how the concepts which will transform absolutely uh, the international humanitarian law are actually born from human suffering? Oh, they're completely born from human suffering. They, but they were both aware of acts of killings that took place, pogroms and other acts of killings. Uh, I mean, they both had written about how these uh, stories from their childhood um, influenced their thinking. In fact, for, for Lemkin, in the end, it was not an act of killing of Jews. It was an act of killing of Armenians by the Turks that really crystallized his thinking. And I think one of the things that's significant for both men is that they truly had a universal approach. They were interested in Lauterpach's case with all human beings, irrespective of their ethnicity, their religion, their nationality. Lauterpach's thesis was absolutely revolutionary. It was that every human being has the same minimum rights under international law simply because they are a human being. And this is radical and revolutionary wherein he's wrote his book in 1945 a bill of rights of man and lemkin's is equally revolutionary lemkin believed that every group must be protected even if it is a tiny group of six people living in a tiny place somewhere because lemkin's main objective in life was to promote cultural diversity for him the heart of life was different cultures, flourishing, interacting, engaging. And for him, the concept of genocide was about protecting cultural var variety and diversity. It's remarkable how Ukrainians are struggling to get, for example, Holodomor uh, and Stalinist crimes against Ukrainians, at least politically, uh, designated as genocide. And uh, Lemkin himself has, I think, this article in early 50s in which he wrote that, yes, these crimes of Stalinism are a genocide against yeah. Ukrainians. Why it is so difficult on the international stage to get, uh, get those events as recognized? Well, f firstly, Lemkin certainly did characterize the Horodomor as a genocide. And this is one of the reasons that his work has been banned in Russia which is, of course, disgraceful. Curiously, my book, East West Street, is translated into Russian and has not been banned, which is odd because it sets out all of his theories. So any Russian who wants to find out about the origins of genocide won't be able to read Lemkin, but they can read Sands on Lemkin. So it's a pretty hopeless form of um, censorship. I think the issue with the challenges with Holodomor today is not what happened, but when it happened. And this is the same, for example, with the killing of the Armenians and with many other acts. 
The concept of genocide was literally invented only in November 1944. It became part of the Nuremberg trial in 45, and then in 48 there was a convention. So there is a complex philosophical, legal, ethical question. But then you have the genocide against Armenians recognized politically uh, as genocide by some well, parliament. Actually, actually, it's much more complex. Some do and some don't. Now, we have just had one very interesting development last year. Germany recognized its treatment of the Herero in what is today called Namibia, what used to be called Southwest Africa, in 1908 as a genocide. This is the first time in history that a country which is a perpetrator country has recognized that its own actions that took place before the concept of genocide was invented could correctly be characterized as a genocide. And this, I think, is fascinating because I think what this has done is now opened the door to a rethinking of what we do with other acts, whether it's the Holodomor or the Armenians or so on and so forth. But it raises the question, how far back in history do you go? What about the British and slavery? I think a lot of people in the Caribbean countries and African countries would say, you know what, frankly, that was a genocide. And then when you open that door, you come to a second door. Huh, okay. If it was genocide, and if it was a crime, surely there's responsibility for that. And with responsibility comes the obligation to make reparation. So very slowly, our societies are beginning to recognize the possibility of going backwards in time. And I think this is going to raise some fascinating issues. For example, in relation to my latest book, The Last Colony, Colonialism. British and French colonialism. Is there an obligation of the British and the French today to make reparation for crimes that were committed 200 years ago? Th these are very complex questions. Let me come back to Lauterbacht and uh, this concept, crime against humanity. Uh, frankly speaking, we have an interesting kind of tradition or not tradition in Ukraine to mistranslate this concept because it's sometimes translated as Zlochin proti ludstva, uh, mankind, crime against mankind. And as lawyers explain to me, it's rather crime against humanity as a concept. Uh, why this, what does it mean? Why crime against humanity? Why not crime against individuals? It's a really good question, Vladimir. Um, I go back to that moment on the 29th of July, 1945. And I imagine these two men sitting in a garden in Cambridge in England, in a nice house. Hirsch Lauterpacht, professor of international law at the University of Cambridge. Robert Jackson, the US Supreme Court Justice, formerly the Attorney General of the United States, now designated by President Truman as the chief prosecutor of Nuremberg. And Jackson tells... Lauterpacht, he's got a problem. They, they, they have a new crime involving the mistreatment of individuals on a very large scale. But there's disagreement about what to call it. And at that moment in the garden in Cambridge, it's Lauterpacht who comes up with the concept of crimes against humanity as a legal concept. He never wrote to explain why he took humanity rather than mankind or individuals. We know he was thinking about individuals because he had just published a book on human rights. It's called An International Bill of the Rights of Man. And I've often asked myself the question, why did he focus on this? He took the language, we think, from a French political statement of 1915 and actually also a Russian political statement of 1915, which used the idea of crimes of humanity. And I think he said, let's take this as a legal concept. But the truth is, 
with the origins of these things, they haven't left behind a record. And so I'm not properly able to answer your question. But I think about it a lot. But it's interesting because, I mean, we have... I think it's the same with the concept of dignity, that I have my first uh, philosophical uh, explanation, definition of dignity. But when you look at EU treaty, for example, and dignity comes as the first value, but is not defined. And uh, crime against humanity against the word humanity is not defined. So in a way, uh, for example, if this is a crime against the humaneness or the idea of being human means being kind or, or not uh, not not fulfill crimes it's it's also a very kind of interesting philosophical idea which tells us that being human is actually good that humans are actually good and uh, crime is a kind of deviation from this uh, I, I, my understanding of what Lauter Pact had in mind but of course different people have different interpretations is that although he was focused on the protection of individuals and rights for individuals, human rights, as we call them today. He also had in his mind the collective of all of humankind. And what the concept of crimes against humanity essentially does is it says, if you mistreat a group of individuals systematically and in a widespread way, you offend not only the rights of those individuals, but you offend not only the rights of those individuals' country, their state, but you offend the whole of humanity. And that is related to a very important idea. When a crime against humanity occurs, any country in the world can exercise jurisdiction over that crime. So if we take what's happening right now in Ukraine, it seems to me, on the basis of what I've seen and the people I've talked to, that there is a very strong argument that crimes against humanity are being perpetrated today, as we sit here in wonderful Lviv, on the territory of Ukraine. Systematic killing of human beings, the systematic targeting of civilian buildings, and a myriad of of other acts of torture and other horrors. Now, what this means is if you can find someone who is responsible for these acts, directly connected, if they travel anywhere in the world, literally, in theory, any country in the world can arrest them and investigate them and prosecute them for crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine. The classical and famous example is the case of Senator Pinochet, who was involved in crimes against humanity, torture, disappearance, mass killing. He arrives in London. There weren't any, well, very many British victims. And he is arrested for crimes against humanity and for genocide. That is what is... In, and, and so this is the essential idea Certain crimes are so terrible that any country in the world can exercise jurisdiction over them, which means, of course, the people who commit these crimes tend not to travel anymore. If I tell you that the, the, these wars, First World War, Second World War, they produced a major revolution in uh, international law by, for example, imposing a kind of a primacy of international law, humanitarian law over the legal systems of particular states and making human beings or groups the real subject, not, not the states, but the, 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 the people. Would you agree with that? And uh, it, that leads to my next question. What revolution should produce this war? Two wonderful questions, Vladimir. So, firstly, I think it's impossible to overstate the significance of what happened in 1945. It was a revolutionary moment. Because until that moment, the sovereignty of the state was absolute. If a state decided from one day to the next, everyone over the age of 45 will be rounded up and killed tomorrow, International law had nothing to say about it. The sovereign could do that. The emperor could do that. The king could do that. The president could do that. 
Along come Laura Pact and Lemkin in 1945, and they say, no, it's over, it's finished. This is the idea that came from Lviv. There are limits on what the state can do. There are limits on what the state can do to the individual, and there are limits on what the state can do to the group. So that was the revolutionary development of 1945, and it changed the world. It's changed this conflict, this war in Ukraine. Look at how Ukraine is using these concepts and compare with last time such horrors were felt on the territory of Ukraine. There was no piece of paper that someone could hold up and say, you can't do this to me. You cannot treat me in this way. You cannot kill me. You cannot torture me. You cannot rape me. You cannot do these things. So that is a total change. And the government of Ukraine is using it extremely effectively. Now you ask, as a related question, what might emerge from this war? It's a big question. One of the areas that is totally unregulated by international criminal law and which has become a big issue in this conflict, is the protection of the environment and the use by the Russian of fear in relation to, for example, nuclear facilities or the targeting of environmental means of attack, attacking dams. This is completely outrageous. Using the environment and harming the environment as a means of war. So one of the things that I hope might come out of this conflict is a new crime that I've been working on, the crime of ecocide, basically endangering the environment, not in order to protect humans, but to protect the environment. So for example, targeting missiles around nuclear facilities, almost certainly a war crime, probably also a crime against humanity, but it should also be a crime of ecocide. So that's one way of answering your question. The second way of answering your question is that we've plainly got a problem. The international legal system is inadequate in enforcing these rules. And one of the things perhaps that might come out of this conflict is new thinking on improving the institutions that we have at the national level and at the international level. There's a great deal of cooperation going on in a way that's never happened before between the public prosecutor's office in Ukraine, and the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. So for me, the accent is on those two things. Thinking beyond the human. The best law review article I ever read when I was a student was published in 1972. It left a deep impression on me by a wonderful uh, American scholar called Christopher Stone. It was called Should Trees Have Standing? And it posited the revolutionary idea that nature should have rights under our legal system. I love this idea. It's, I've never forgotten it. Ever since I read it, I've always thought, that seems right. Why do only human beings have rights? Why do corporations have rights? Why can't natural objects, animals, fish, trees have rights? And this I've always found very inspiring. And I'm sort of hoping that this moment might be the one in which we can move out of an extensively anthropocentric approach to the function of the law and look beyond the human. That's a fantastic idea and I will share with you my my ideas which really resonate with it because I'm trying to describe the history of uh, of maybe let's call it humanity as a kind of a extension of the space for dignity. So if we take the very concept of dignity in the Roman Empire, it was like dignity for patricians. Dignity is something that you deserve in a battle or something, a status, and then you will, it's inalienable, you, you cannot give it away. Then the whole story with Christianity and then modernity is how this concept of dignity is extended to cover eventually all human beings. And I think this revolution that you described with Lauterpacht and, and Lemkin is the way how it extends to individuals which are not uh, uh, protected by the state, for example, people without citizenship, or the groups which are may, might be subject to one particular state but might be annihilated by the state as the Holocaust, right? 
But if we have one word to describe the 21st century, it's the extension of the dignity to a non-human world, exactly. So to, 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 to living beings. And that's very, very interesting. And I think in this war we have this, and we have the reaction of the Ukrainians uh, towards the Russian atrocities, not only towards humans. We see how these Russian soldiers are killing dogs, killing horses, destroying the eco parks, and, and this is also very important. Yeah. But coming back to the second uh, issue, in a way we have still the state sovereignty unchallenged in the institution called uh, the Security Council of the UN, right? And uh, we, we don't have the um, inevitability of punishment responsibility, right? So should we proceed to that? Absolutely. And Absolutely. That's absurd. I mean, the world in 2022 is not the world of 1945. Why is the UK, United Kingdom a permanent member of the Security Council? It makes no sense. It's a small northern country which has difficult relations with Europe and other parts of the world, struggling for a place, permanent member of the Security Council. It makes no sense uh, today. I think we need to rethink. Not that the United Kingdom doesn't have a very important role, potentially. It's generally committed to the rule of law. But I think the problem that we have uh, as a society, as an international society, is we're not very good at amending, at reforming. If you look at the history of international structures, it follows a very similar pattern. You have a moment of construction, operation, and then disaster. And you rebuild, and you start again. And each time that happens, they always take, or we always take, from what came before. And we say, we'll improve it, we'll add this, we'll fix it like this, we'll mend that, we'll change it, the structures, the representation, the numbers. And of course, very soon again, it's not perfect. The crucial thing is that we know we need an international system of rules. We've got to live together on this small place we call home. And a world without rules is not going to function efficiently for very long. The difference of opinion is what should the rules be? And one of the fundamental questions is, should the rules be related only to relations between states? I say no, or should it include also other actors? Humans, associations, corporations, nature. And I think that's where the interesting debate is. And for my students right now, that's the thinking that excites me the most. What comes next? And it may be that this terrible war in Ukraine is a harbinger, is a moment of catalyst to cause some new thinking to come into being about how when the next reorganization comes, we will reorganize ourselves. Now, I don't know what direction it will take, but the nature of human evolution tells you that with every act of construction, there is subsequently an act of catastrophe, and we rebuild again, and we always rebuild on the basis of what existed before. My last question is related to human stories, and... Uh, you are one of the fantastic examples how you connect law with with human history and with uh, stories of particular people. So you're basically showing that experience of these particular people brought up the revolution in, in, in legal systems. But that means that uh, law doesn't come from above and maybe there is no also natural law. So law is also the product of, of history. But then that leads me to a, a, a very... A uh, worrying question is that if the law is so much related to human experience, what do we do with those people who just don't have an experience, this experience? And uh, what do we do with people who do not have experience of crimes against humanity, genocide, and they say, okay, this is not ours, and we will not adopt it as an international law? Well, you know, one of the things is I like human beings. I'm yet to find any human being who doesn't have something interesting about them. I, I just think we are inherently interesting. And if you approach any human being with an open mind, there's a story to tell. What I've wanted to do with these last books that I've been writing is address big political, legal, historical stories, but through the lens 
of certain individuals who were in some way participants, not the famous participants. I'm not interested in those people. I'm interested in some of the behind the scenes people who actually make things happen. They generate ideas or they live through an experience and they cause something to happen. And that's because I've come to understand that generally readers are pretty smart and pretty intelligent and they are able to engage with matters of real complexity if it's presented through a human lens. So when I came to Lviv in 2010 and stumbled across this story totally by accident, I wasn't looking for it. I can take no credit for having found it because it just came by accident. I opened a door which led to a place which caused me to explore the relationship between the individual and the group, something I'm fascinated by. Who am I? How do I identify myself? Am I an individual? Or I'm a, which group do I consider myself to be associated with? Is it my football team? Is it the country I happen to be a member of? Is it a religious thing? Is it my color of my skin? Is it, you know, my sexual orientation? You know, all of the things that we, that we have. And I became completely fascinated by that. And so the relationship between crimes against humanity and genocide became a lens to explore that story. But it needed another lens. And the other lens were these two remarkable characters, Lauterpacht and Lemkin, as well as a third man we haven't mentioned, Hans Frank, who was Adolf Hitler's lawyer for many years, a highly cultured individual, shockingly cultured, who got involved in mass murder and ended up being hanged at Nuremberg. And these three men, along with my grandfather, became the vehicle to tell a story of universal interest. And what has fascinated me with this book about Lviv. Lviv is the beating heart. It's, it's the main character in this book. Is the book has now been translated into more than 30 languages. I go all over the world. I go to Mexico. I go to Bangladesh. I go to South Africa to talk about East West Street. Everyone now knows about Lviv, also because of the conflict. And what people say is, this story resonates with me. There are no Poles here, there are no Jews here, there are no Ukrainians here, there are no Germans here. This is our story. They said in Mexico, they said in Bangladesh. One group doing something to another group. One community doing something to another individual. And I think this is completely fascinating. And I'll leave you with one final thought. The book came out in 2016. I've probably done more than 300 events about 50 events a year about East West Street. I have not had one event, not a single event, at which, at the end of the event, someone comes up to me at the end and says, my mother was from Lviv, or my grandfather was from Lviv. It's incredible. And I think there is a great project to be done on exploring the diaspora of many different religions and nationalities and ethnicities of people who have been connected to this extraordinary city and this place. And that for me is fascinating. There is a universal beating heart to these stories, but ultimately you tell such stories through individuals who of course have their particular circumstances. That's the magic I think of what I learned in Lviv. Philip Stans, thank you so much for your books, for telling the story about Lviv and for joining this podcast. Uh, it's just brilliant to be with you. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it hugely. Thank you. This was an episode of Thinking in Dark Times, a podcast series by Ukraine World. I spoke to Philip Sands, a famous British and French writer and lawyer, about the concepts of genocide and crimes against humanity and about the future of international law. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko, I'm a Ukrainian philosopher and journalist and chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Thinking in Dark Times aims to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You 
You can support us at patreon.com slash Ukraine world. We devote the majority of your donations to help people affected by this war and to help Ukrainian defenders. Patreon.com slash Ukraine world. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine. Thank you.